Hello everyone, today on Scottish Memories, I am chatting to Katrina Bryan. So how are you all? Hope you are all happy and healthy and well out there wherever you are. Just before we get started today, please remember as always, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button both on YouTube and on podcast. And if you're listening on podcast, uh, be kind of you, you know. Give us a wee review as well, that'd be lovely, you know, little five stars, it's not going to hurt, it's not going to hurt. Also, if any of you fancy supporting the channel, uh, either YouTube or podcast, in any other way, why don't you go check out our merchandise. There is a link in the description, you can get things like this Clan Brunford sweater that I'm wearing and so, so, so much more. But today, I'm really excited, I am talking to Katrina Bryan. You may recognise Katrina from the Toon Fair, Night Pub, Rab C. Nisbet, Taggart, Asylum, Fried, Cops and Monsters, Molly and Mac, Emmerdale, and of course loads of you will recognise her as Nina from CBB's Nina and the Neurons. Katrina, hello, how are you? Hello, I'm fine, how are you? I'm, I'm good, thank you so much for doing this. It genuinely means the world for you to take the time and come on. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. So just before we get started, how are you? Are you healthy and happy and well and everything like that? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Like, we're sort of in lockdown three at the minute, so everyone's sort of getting a bit restless from not seeing family and friends and stuff. And yeah. I'm no different to that. But I'm lucky, actually. I'm managing, I'm still working. We're um, I'm filming with CBBs at the minute. Uh, Molly and Mac that we do for CBBs. So I'm super, super lucky. I know. I think. I think. And I. And I think in a couple of years I might be watching you quite a lot. I have a funny feeling. I think definitely get that. <laughs> how old's the? How old's your child? Doesn't she's. Matter. She's almost five months. Lillian's oh, almost five. Never months. too young for CBBs. Get it on. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I think I've got. I've got three nieces. Yeah. And two of them, when they find out that I'm chatting to you, I because the, the other one's only about a year, but the other two, I think, when they find out that I'm chatting to you, their their lid might blow. They'll be like, <laughs> What? <laughs> <laughs> well, if they're, they're a bit older, they might be disappointed that I don't have bunches anymore. Mm. Um, I used to have bunches when I did Nina the Scientist, and the folk are always very disappointed when I've cut them off. And they're also disappointed to find out I'm not a real scientist. Like, what do you mean you're not a real scientist? <laughs> Sorry, I've got a C in biology. I'm really sorry. Just well, you did better than me then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll, I'll dive right in. So whereabouts whereabouts in old Scotty land did you grow up? I'm from Gatehouse of Fleet in Dumfries and Galloway. Oh, nice. Down in the Solway coast, yeah. Oh, some of the most beautiful parts of Scotland down there. In the hidden corner, they call it, you know. It is kind of hidden, that sort of area, and, and I'm, I know I'm guilty of it, not getting to explore it enough, and it seems like it, it does kind of get forgotten about, and it's a shame. Yeah, I think it's, it doesn't have, like, a, a, a city. You don't have a city to sort of, like, uh, have big, massive events in to sort of get people down, and it's not quite got the drama of the Highlands, yeah. you know? But honestly, it's such a cracking place for a holiday. I think, what's the statistic? It's the second least populated area of Scotland to the Highlands. And the second largest area to the Highlands in Scotland, uh -huh. you know, so it's really peaceful, beautiful beaches, and Gatehouse is just like a few miles from the beach, so it was a glorious place to to be. This up. is something that comes up a lot as well. That it's unbelievable how many nice beaches that such a wet, dreek country like ours can have. We've got some incredible beaches. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. all the way along the South Coast, uh, the Solway Coast there, and all the way along to like. Port Patrick and all that, all along there, it's just gorgeous. And I think when you get used to enjoying a beach in the hail and the absolute horrible weather, then you really, it means you really appreciate a beach. You know, no. like, if it's not raining and the sun's out, you're like, well, this is just golden. Doesn't I can remember going uh, on uh, wee family trips down to like Seaton Sands, sort of uh, just outside Edinburgh and things like that, and going for swims in the sea there. And <laughs> yeah. Just going, yeah, okay. I, and every now and again, I, I, I'm not, I, I've got no idea of the science behind it, but you being a scientist, obviously, you might well, be able to. I, I, <laughs> I can all remember it swimming out in the sea, which is essentially the Firth of Forth and then the North Sea, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> And all of a sudden, randomly finding little hot pockets of water and stopping there for a little while and going, oh, okay, right, okay, now on I go. 
<laughs> for, for our, I remember our um, school, our summer holidays, remember you'd have a school, that's it, summer trip when you were in primary school. Yeah. And I remember when we were in really little classes like P1, 2, 3, we'd be taken to the local beach. And I also remember being in the water like five years old. I don't remember being cold. You're just no, like, I ah, don't. We're, we're swimming. This is amazing. Uh, buckets and spades and all that. But it, it wasn't There quite... was always that trepidation before you went in. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was that sort of, oh, that, when that water first hit you. But then yeah. once you were cold, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And funny enough, this summer, um, me and my uh, fiancé did a trip away up north and we were at a lovely beach in Clachtoll, up in the sort of northwest. And I couldn't believe it. it was a beautiful day, but still the water was freezing and loads of kids and playing. Yeah. It was so lovely to see that, you know, you adapt, don't you? You're not going to go, no, we're in a country that's like really gets above 20, so we're never going to go in the water. No, no, I don't, I don't. Billy Connolly did a great sketch about it when he got taken on school trips as well. I remember him saying, you know, just the teachers going, go on, in you get your big Jesse, yeah, on you go, and just with these woolen swim trunks running into the water, apparently. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I remember that sketch, yeah, yeah. Um, so, what was it like growing up in that sort of area then? You know, without a big city and essentially just having the countryside beside you, that must have been incredible. Well, yeah, and of course, oh, was brilliant you know and of course because I was brought up in the 80s you know that was back in the day of you were like during the weekends of the summer holidays you were sent out after breakfast and told to come back at meal times and because we weren't a, a, like gatehouse the population's about a thousand folk so the kids from ranging from a difference of like 10 years would all kind of hang out together yeah. you know and uh, you would traipse away up through the woods you would go all, all over the place through fields oh, it's great and then of course as you got a wee bit older you're like i'm bored you know um you used to just hang about the streets and probably annoy all I, I, I was i was kind of lucky i kind of uh, managed to avoid the hanging about in the streets because i played rugby as a kid they, I. um so at night times it was essentially training and at the weekends it was a game and then you know, hanging out with the team afterwards. So there was always a nice crowd and a safe area, safe mm -hmm. space to play in. So I, I slightly avoided the hanging out on street corners a bit. But you definitely saw there, was, there used to be, do you remember Presto's supermarkets that used to be yes. everywhere? Mm -hmm. It was outside Presto's. I can remember all the kids standing outside Presto's. Even when it was shut, that's where they were hanging out. I don't know why. Well, that's it. You always, it's funny, isn't it? It's obviously some sort of like, something to do with familiarity, a territory, territory thing, you know, just about that one spot that you always hang out. And when we were a bit older, um, you just walk up and down the street. You were always desperate for a, to get to the age where you could drive. That was yeah. the goal. <laughs> Everybody was so looking forward to it. But in Gatehouse, there's still there, a thing called the Birdhouse. And they built it specifically in the car park. And if anyone knows Gatehouse, beautiful little town. There's just one main high street in the spa shop that next to the car park, that's where you go and park your car. And there's this lovely wee building. It's just a roof and like slated roof and some seats underneath it. And it's been nicknamed the Birdhouse. Uh, and that's where we used to sit. <laughs> we used to sit there <laughs> and just probably moan about how we were bored. But then, of course, as you do look back and go, God, we were so lucky. Just hanging yeah. up with pals. There's never too, you know, there's never like terrible dramas either way you know at the time you want excitement but when you look back you're like it's pretty good it's funny i, I i'm the same i look back and, and i think like i it was great days hanging out with the crowds that i was very lucky with a group of friends i had um mm. and my old when, when when i got to that age of hanging out and all those sort of kid dramas they were so big at the time and then you look back and then i'm like oh my god that person kissed that person when they're actually going out with that person and that was the biggest thing it was, it was huge, but it, it, it was important to you at the time. Yeah, well, that's the thing, isn't it? And that's what I feel sorry for a lot of kids around the teenage years now during lockdown, because mates and your peers is the most important thing in your life for a good few years, you know, maybe even into the double digits all the way up to your mid-twenties, you know? Yeah. It's all about your mates, it's all about relationships and all that. And, and, uh, and It does the, shape you, doesn't it? It really does shape you. Yeah, and just getting to hang out, especially in Gatehouse, because I say there was always people a bit younger and a bit older, it helps you know how to be amongst people. 
and sometimes be amongst people that you know you might not be similar to you know all those yeah. types of things but also what I think has always um, set me up pretty well is that when you come from a, a wee place you know how to make your own fun <laughs> you know yeah uh, I met uh, a lot of pals from what, London when I went up to drama school and and they found it really difficult when we were in a place in Edinburgh I moved to Edinburgh when I was 18 and our campus was in the middle of nowhere just a kind of housing estate and they found it really hard because there was nothing to entertain them no clubs right. no nothing to go to whereas we built like, oh as long as we're together we can have a laugh you know yeah 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 absolutely absolutely the, the, that sort of being able to form because I, I, I got I, I got that one with yeah forming a bond with children but I'm what I call a lonely child got no brothers or sisters so when I remember going on holiday with our mum and dad and being able to just go up to kids and say hi yeah what well, can i play can you yeah, that's it's a big skill it's a good skill to have yeah yeah i think that's nearly a personality thing i don't think that's a you know it's a skill but some kids just couldn't even dream of doing that and yeah. i often think it's an amazing thing to have and that'll you know see you right about your whole life if you've got the confidence just to say hello yeah yeah totally what sort of games did you, because I remember when you said, you know, just playing games, my head went straight to like rounders. I remember playing rounders yeah, yeah. and Kirby. I was a legend at Kirby. Oh, you know, God, I could, do, I could go a game of Kirby. That'd be good it's great. <laughs> There's too many cars parked on the roads now, but I used to love Kirby. Oh, yeah, the satisfaction when that ball came straight back. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we should explain, should explain, I suppose, for anyone around the world that doesn't know what Kirby is. Um, it's essentially, you've got a ball. It was like a football or basketball, generally, it would be, wouldn't it? One person on one curb, one person on the other curb of the road, and you had to throw the ball, and it had to bounce exactly off the curb. And then you had to catch it. Oh, see, I don't remember that. Really. I just thought it had to come back to you. Of course, I'm sure there are variations across the country. <laughs> Maybe no, I think maybe I'm remember we what we did was you threw it, bounced, hopefully came back. You're probably right. Maybe we didn't have to catch it then, but then you moved to the middle of the road. Oh, flashback! I'd forgotten that. Yeah, yeah. You after you managed to get it, you then got to move to the middle of the road, and then you were thrown at the curb shorter, but you had to catch it then. So you got a point for every time you caught it, and if it missed. And the person you're playing against caught the ball and threw the ball at you, and it hit you before you got to the end. They got all your points. <laughs> that's, that's neat. That should be a sport. Really, should it, it should be a sport. If, if if they could make a film of dodgeball, then they could make a film of Kirby. Oh, yeah. That the problem is, you know, no one's going to make money out of that. So as once we can find a way to monetize it, then it's happening. <laughs> No, I know. Maybe that. Maybe that's what I should do. I should make a Kirby World Championship, and then that. Then it will properly take off. And <laughs> um, try to think of other games. Well, there was buzzer. We we played buzzer. Again, I think it's one of different, different names around the country. Um, How did you play buzzer? It was like hide and seek, but there was a den. I the starting point of where you went. You went head from. So yeah. Count at the den. And then as the person was looking for you, you and if you were hiding, you had to get back to the den and shout one, two, three, buzzer. All right. Okay. That's essentially how we played hide and seek, except it was what we would say one, two, three, I'm no he. Because, <laughs> because you were essentially it. You were essentially it for if you were the person chasing and catching. Right, right. So like, if, if we were playing hide and seek, you would count and then you would off you would go. And then if you found them, you had to race them back to the den. Right, and yeah. Yeah, it was either one, two, three, I'm no he, or whoever's, uh, who, one, two, three, he, whoever's caught. I can't remember because that's going to annoy me now that I can't remember what you said. But yeah, that's essentially how we played hide and seek. Oh, that was a great game. Remember the adrenaline rush? Oh God, will I go, will I go? Can you see me? Am I going to make it? <laughs> I've, never been, I've never been fast, so I had to be tactical. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was actually the, the group of friends that I had. I was always the smallest. I was, I was the youngest and the smallest. So, I, I, when you played it, if the last person, sorry, the first person to get caught, they would be it yeah. for the next game. Yeah, yeah. That's how we did it as well. And it was always me because I was always small. Or, it, or if you didn't catch anyone, if they all managed to free themselves, then you had to be it again. <laughs> it would always be me. Oh, I know it'd be dull if you end up having to be it too much. Or that. 
started to feel a little bit like ostracized. You did. I remember, like I said, being young. <laughs> this is turning into a therapy session now. I remember when I was young, um, one time playing, and probably a couple of times, but I definitely remember at least one time where everyone ran away and counted. And they all just sat together at one bit and just sat and chat and had a laugh and I couldn't find any of them. Oh, no. Oh, that's horrid. I know. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> I, might, I might be a big, big lad now, but at the time I was just a wee boy. I was like, move. <laughs> and we came up with a game and actually that's great and genius. When we were a bit older, when we did finally have a car, I had like a wee e-reg Fiesta. I had a Fiesta for my first car. Oh, I loved it. Gorgeous. Um, and yeah, it was what once and of course once you finally got the car, you didn't actually go anywhere, you just sat in the car park in yeah. your car. But we came up with Well, you couldn't afford petrol. Exactly. We came up with hide and seek in your car. And the boundaries of Gatehouse. You weren't allowed to go past certain points, but you had to and we'd be lucky to get like maybe two or three cars, but one had to stay in the car park while the others went and hid. And it was just brilliant. We had so much fun. So like you'd either try and find somewhere where you were literally trying to hide your car and somewhere dark or a busy street with one spare space, you'd park right in it and then you'd have to hide as cars came by. Oh, that was really, like, that's good clean fun. That is. <laughs> that is. <laughs> well, you're obviously 17 plus. That was pretty. The only <laughs> game I can tell you about, <laughs> because it's a, but that's a, I'm always impressed with our thinking for that because it was good. I fun. love the fact that you essentially played hide and seek in your car with the entire town. <laughs> yeah, I know. And these winter nights when it was dark and there was like no one around. Ah. The thing is, well, I suppose if it was quite a small area. Like there wouldn't really be an issue with people getting into trouble or anything. So it's not as if you were causing any trouble. You were essentially just playing hide and seek. I know. That's the thing. We weren't probably the least amount of trouble we ever caused. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were trying to hide, so we'd have a little music down low. And the yeah. joy of it was you were kind of playing hide and seek, but you'd traditionally always be on your own hiding somewhere. You were with other people in the car. And it was hilarious when you know, like a car was coming by. And you're like, hide, hide, quiet, quiet. I know. And there is something nice about that sort of. I don't want to use the phrase "small town mentality" because it's not small community sort of thing where you can get away like that. It's when you were telling the story, then I, I remember a random story about my cousin because um, uh, grew up in a small town just outside Edinburgh. And on his stag do, which was, he did the night before the wedding, which, you know, never happens now. Oh, yeah. But he, he got married in the late 80s. Um, his mates stripped him and left him to walk home in the village and get home on his own. And he told me the story that he got fairly close to home, jumping in and out of bushes, as you would. Well, his mum and dad's home, because, you know, that's where, that's where he was going. Um, and the police stopped. In the small village, and the police stopped them, were showing the light, and was like, "What are you doing?" And he was like, was "A little bit drunk. So it's my, it's been my stag do. I'm getting married tomorrow, and they stripped me, and I'm just trying to get home." And, and, and the police were like, "Oh, all right, okay, come on, out you come." And he got out to just about at the car, and they apparently did the siren as loud as they could, and then drove off. <laughs> No way, that's brilliant. <laughs> They've been paid off by his mates. I know, but that sort of local small town thing, that's the busiest they'd been that night. You know what I mean? That's what had happened. They're like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I think as well, he then told me that he, he got home. Obviously, no keys, no money, no nothing. Climbed up the tree in the front garden, naked, which was probably quite brave. Wow. <laughs> Throwing stones at the window to wake up his mum and dad. They came out to let him in, and then he told them to go away. He's like, go away! <laughs> Leave the door open and go away! <laughs> There's gonna, he's going to be scarred from that, isn't he? I'm sure he's going to love that. I, I've not <laughs> yeah. said his name. He's going to love that I've shared this story as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the, after the, during that sort of... Uh, 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 the, when you were growing up, I can remember more words then, so English left my head for a second. <laughs> what sort of holidays was it for you then? Was it staycations around, around Scotland or? Um, early on, we actually would go down to Morecambe 
That was ah, it. yeah. Well, I suppose it's not that far, really, is it? Well, that's the, the joy of being like right at the bottom there. You know, you're only about an hour and a bit away from Carlisle, and you know, so, yeah. When we'd go to mock and, and then we'd we quite liked. Um, in fact, when I was also we went to Cooper once with another family. We had. Wow. We, there's eat. not much in Cooper either. Well, I think the thought was, because I, I think I did ask for that, because uh, I know Fife really well there, and I often go myself, like, along the coast there, you know, to Anstruther and Pitman and all those places now. But I've never said to mum and dad, why are we in Cooper? It was a central area, because I think we went to St Andrews one day. Right, OK. Because we did that. We had a nice self-catering cottage, um, and there was another family with kids. And I do remember that. And I also remember that was the holiday a bat came down the chimney and oh I want wait I want to hear that story (laughs) of course I think I must have only been about five or six so my enduring memory is seeing my dad and his pal running around the living room trying to catch this bat and all they'd managed I think one of them had a tea towel and one had a board game like the outside box of a board game try to catch this bat (laughs) and I think I don't remember anyone being like Screaming, it was more like hilarity, but just what a, I think the house is probably one of these lovely little cottages that probably yeah. would be nobody in it. You know, it was quite entertaining. But I also remember going to St Andrews. It wasn't all just like um, bats flying around that holiday. <laughs> that makes sense because it came up a lot as well. That sort of sort of Perthy, Fifey area, sort of there. It is essentially the gateway to the north, really, isn't it? But yeah. you are central there. You can get to everywhere. You can get to Glasgow. You can get to Edinburgh. You can get to Kirkcaldy. You can get to St Andrews quite easily. I think it wasn't until I was older and living in Edinburgh that I went more north, you know, because right. it is quite a journey from the south coast there all the way up north. So I think, yeah, we'd go to Glasgow. Um, I think maybe the furthest north we got was Dundee. <laughs> Being in Dundee. Um, and I don't even think as a family we managed to go to Edinburgh. But um, Ayr was our... Um, we'd go to air quite a lot. That Air's was, lovely. Yeah, love air. I did panto in air at the Gatey once. It's a great place. Really enjoy it. And that was our kind of, if we were wanting a wee weekend or Christmas shopping, we'd maybe treat ourselves and stay over in a hotel site. So that, that used to feel quite good when I was maybe about 10, 11. Like, oh, we're going to stay in a hotel. <laughs> That's lovely. Though. That's nice. That's yeah. nice. So, do, do, so do, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on Pantos there, so you said it because it's came up a lot in this, and because like I said, I've interviewed uh, people like uh, Grant Stott, uh, Alan Stewart, Andy Gray, and, and all these people that you know. The Panto is a big part of Scottish culture, well, British culture, but it definitely is a big part of Scottish culture. What would, was it was always something you enjoy to do. Do you get a chance to do it now still? Yeah, yeah, totally. Panto is a big part of my sort of life and career now. Um, I did my first one straight out of drama school at the Brunton in Musselburgh. Bru- I know the Brunton. Panto was my first professional acting job. Is what I think it's probably most of our first professional acting job. Yeah, in fairness. Part, you know, yeah, it's the time of year where there's like far more work available than yeah. any other time. So, you know, it's more chance of getting a job. So it was, it was, I always loved doing it those early days. I did, I did a few in the Brunton and uh, I think I, I'm trying to remember how, I think I've done about 14 now. Wow. That's yeah. a fair few. I've done, and then it was about 2011. I went down south for the first time, um, and did them. So I've been doing them sort of all over the south of England, and mm. and I was in Derby. Where was I? Oh, I didn't do it last year. The last one I did was Derby Arena, which is quite. That, that's lo- wow! That's lovely. That's brilliant. Yeah. And uh, I, I've always loved. It. I think it's a great. Um, it's the most fun job. It's the hardest working job you have to do often. But the most fun and like you get a good gr- a good group of people and you can just have such a laugh. Yeah, is that I've got a real soft spot for it. I think at, at, at some point, if I decide to dust off the old acting clogs again, I I would love to get back. I'd, I'd love to. It was Dame. I loved playing the Dame. Oh, right, I, I would love to go back into doing that sort of thing. I don't know. I don't know if that's a kind of difficult to find people to do now. I'm hoping by the time I get older, it will be, and I'll be like, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, you never know. Although there's a. It's funny, like some people progress. You can see, like they're the comic character, and then as they get older, they'll sort of progress to the dame. Oh, that's a hard gig, though. That's a hard gig being dame. Yeah, costume changes. 
every, every traditionally every time the dame comes on, they're supposed to be in a different costume. Oh, I like I can, Katie. One costume done. <laughs> and a lot of the time you might even just be in the box. You might you just get the box, you don't need to come on stage, you just be like, This walk. is my magic box. <laughs> you don't have to walk, they just fly you on. So you don't remember your cue. Somebody else is gonna press that button. <laughs> Stand there all of a sudden you're just like, Whoa! <laughs> what scene is this? Okay, I'm on. <laughs> I just I, I just need to wave the wand again. We'll be fine. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so what age were you when you moved to Edinburgh? I was 18. Straight from school, I'm at, I was super lucky and get into uh, the acting degree course. At, the QMU? Uh, at QMU. Yeah. So um, we were up in the Clermiston campus, which was like, I was saying, like in the middle of a sort of, in the suburbs. So there was Yeah, it really, it really was in the middle. Obviously, it's moved now. It's actually out by Musselburgh now. But yeah, because um, yeah, I, I did a couple of courses there in my time. It really was essentially in the middle of a house and estate. Exactly. So our and our digs, uh, our halls were there as well. So we were like, doo, doo, doo. but because again, coming from a little town, I was like, this is so cool. It's so busy, yeah. and and the student union they had, sorry, the student union they had. I remember like my pals from bigger cities being like, this is so lame, and I was like, it's the biggest club I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I was there every day. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I got the same. I got the same, but in the opposite way because I went down to London to go to drama school oh, from right. being up here. So that it was a kind of it was like, oh my god, this is so big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it was just so exciting, and and oh, it was just great. And you feel your the joyous thing about going to uni or college or something like that is that you get to share that those first experiences of oh my god life and with other people that are going through it at the same time as you you know yeah. especially like I stayed in halls and the girl I moved into the room next door to is still one of my best pals now you know and uh, so I think I, I just I had such a brilliant time and then I, I stayed in Edinburgh for 20 odd years well wow, that's, a, that's a fair chunk yeah I've only just recently moved away which I was dead sad about I miss it so much we're um, still here you can always come back to go back so much um but yeah so we moved from there me and my pal lived in easter road then i think i went to portobello and then i was down and uh, up in morningside and then leaf oh oh that there's a jump up to up to morningside portobello to morningside to leaf you know up and down. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true but what's it, what was your sort of haunts about edinburgh then 20 years you must have got to know the city quite well yeah um oh well, of course, the, the initial haunts, they've all been knocked down and turned into flats. Um, yeah. So the, the later haunts, me and my pals would uh, do the classic, go for a, a drink in North Street, you know, right. and, depending how dressed up you wanted to get, you wanted to get dressed up, and you're feeling fancy, go to George Street. Yeah. And uh, we, I, me, and my, me and my mates never got into anywhere on George Street. <laughs> Do you, have your, do you have your trainers on, I? Yes, exactly. Well, that's it, it's your own fault. Yeah. <laughs> or even if you had kind of smart shoes, but they were rubber soled, you know, they were, just, they were just like, nah, sorry, lads. You're like, oh, come on, I've got a shirt on and everything. It shows you the difference, doesn't it? It's terrible, actually. As a group of girls, you're never turned away. Mm. <laughs> it's terrible. We were turned away a load, so we always ended up down the grass market or or at the cow gate at the kitchen and and things yeah. like that. Three sisters. Yeah, our choice was either if you're dressed up, the George Street and the like, and if you if you want to just have good fun and have your trainers on, then go to the grass market. Yeah. Biddy Mulligans and that. Oh, some good times. Biddy Mulligans is. You used to go there so much because they always have such good bands on. And yeah. Biddy like it. Live yeah. music there is brilliant. And I know that, like, it was always a wee bit touristy, but it kind of meant that it was, it always had a great atmosphere. You yeah. Know, sometimes it could get a wee bit too stag or hen do heavy, but generally it was just people wanting to have a good time. And if you fancied just like letting your hair down and, and having a laugh, at, oh, we had some really good nights in Biddy Mulligan's, or we'd try not to go to Biddy's. <laughs> You'd be like, right, we'll go to the grass market and we'll try somewhere different, but you'd always end up back there. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 we'd, we'd jump between bays or Finnegan's Wake up in Victoria. That was always good as well. Yeah. And uh, 
more often than not, oh my god, what's the name of the club? The one with the different floors near Finnegan. Espionage. Oh, you know, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's oh. that's when you knew a night had taken a bit of a wrong. It's it's closed now, so we can see it. But that's <laughs> when you knew it took a bit of a wrong turn. If you had nowhere else to go, if you ended up in espionage, I know, I know. <laughs> and that happened a lot. Yeah, we must have we must have been out in town roughly about the same time because it's all the sort of the same haunts. Because I'm sure it's moved on since then. Now it'll all be different that's places it. now. Yeah, totally. Um, so probably in the last few years. I don't think I would have been in espionage that much because <laughs> um, I just moved away a couple of years. I'm mature now and wouldn't do such things. But, um, you know, so more like going to lovely restaurants, like, oh, there's so many new lovely ones I'm missing now that I keep seeing my pals trying out. But my recommendation for a restaurant would be uh, Chez Jules. you ever been? No, I haven't. Where's that? I think it's on Hanover Street. You know, like you come from Princess Street and up Hanover Street and then you go over George Street and down and the other side. And then start to go down, yeah. So, yeah, it's on the downside and down some steps. We French restaurant, oh, sorry, not we at all. It's quite big. And they do the most amazing menu. And, like, it's really cheap uh, for lunch. You can get, like, three courses for, like, nine quid. That sounds too cheap. 11 quid or something. And it's yeah. absolutely gorgeous. I highly recommend it. There's there's actually that sort of area, Hanover Street, Castle Street, Frederick Street. Those sort, yeah. There's so many lovely little restaurants on those streets. Yeah. There really is. Yeah. And the, the wee nice street, is it Thistle Street? Yeah. There's lots of gorgeous wee restaurants there. And, of course, down, can't forget Leith. Um, oh, Leith be- Leith's got some incredible places. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I miss very much... Uh, Tutor's Landing, that was our sort of hub of choice. Yeah. I can't remember the name of their restaurant, the affiliated one, but um, we'd often go in there as well. I'm I think I did. Hungry now. <laughs> I th- th- that's happened a lot, especially when I've interviewed people who, who are now down south. Um, who was it? Recently, Sarah Stewart, and ages ago when I um, interviewed Gordon Kennedy, both of them gave me a row because I ended up making them want a Lucas ice cream. And oh, they were miles they're... away from it. So they're like, this just isn't fair. <laughs> I get I get care packages from my mum and dad. That's yeah. Just, yeah, generally haggis and tatty scones, lawn sausage, and from there's a bakery, Irvin's Bakery in Castle Douglas that does the most amazing shortbread. <laughs> so <laughs> you're usually I'm going just... to dive into that in a minute or two with you. <laughs> you're usually just getting on track with your fitness regime or something, and then you're like, oh no, there's a parcel come from Gatehouse. Oh no. I used, I used to get that down. So when I was at college, because my mum and dad had a little um, post office general shop, um, and they because it was really easy for them to send care packages. My mum would just go around the little shelves of the shop, and then the post office was part of the shop, so she would just do it straight in there. But it was never, you know, here's a cup of soups. Here's it was never anything like that. It was here's Twixies, here's Kit Kats, here's Mars bars, here's the and when a pack and she'd send it to the college because the college would accept packages for us. Um because we'd never be in for packages. Yeah, yeah. And I'd always know when there was a package for me because the the my mates were waiting for me at the office. They were going, there's a, there's a, there's a package for there, there Tony, because it was food and chocolate. They're like, come on, dish it out. <laughs> Superb. Yeah. Usually I would I would be home much more often than I have been. So, yeah. So it's very sweet of them to do that for me because usually I just stock up myself. Are you missing it? Are you missing it uh, up here? Oh, so much. So much. I'm like, I'm, see, I'm lucky because I'm, because I'm working in Glasgow. Um, I've got a critical worker letter, so I'm allowed to travel and I don't use public transport. I just drive up and down. Yeah. I've been in Glasgow, so it's been, I've been able to be around. Get that hit a little bit. Yeah, yeah. which I think you'd need every now and then. Um, So that's been nice. But none of my family are in Glasgow um, and I've only got a few mates in Glasgow. um, So I really miss them. And, And it's funny, I think I even said them with the length of time that it's been. I miss the place, like an actual kind of ache, you know, like oh, yeah. the bee and, and like Gatehouse is just so beautiful and the walks you can do. And of course, because all we do right now is go for walks <laughs> that I really appreciate that how gorgeous it is back home and how much I miss certain different walks and different views and different woods and 
and just... we we've really got it lucky with the views and the and it, I mean it's funny you when you were saying right at the beginning that you know your area is the second least populated mm -hmm. in Scotland and the Highlands and what came into my head was we're not that populated as it is mm -hmm. you know what I mean there, there's only five and a half million people in the whole of Scotland and that's including children so they're only small. Uh, so you know, there's the, the, we're really lucky that there's so much space and so few of us to take it up. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I I totally noticed that being down here now. Um, we're in Manchester at the minute, but we were, last year we were further south in St Albans, and and these just more heavily populated. Of course, I know I did live in the city, but where we are, it's more sort of suburby, but still as busy as when I was living near Leith Walk in Edinburgh. Yeah. You know, yeah. just the amount of houses and flats there are. And because the walks, they're lovely, but there's not as many of them. By God, they're busy in a nice day, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You in a crowd trying to walk around a lake. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you do. And, and again, I mean, Edinburgh, city-wise, it's not big. It's not big. It's not massively populated. You know, there's, there's plenty of space to get, uh, you know, get space if you want. And I still go out now i haven't been but I'm, I'm going out and taking more walks around about the city to do little bits of filming here and there but you really feel how quiet it is right yeah I bet one of my favorite things to do from very early on from living in edinburgh in fact when we first moved to easter road which was like 1999 or something was walking from there up to the royal mile and then up the royal mile and, yeah. and that's what i love about edinburgh is that it's so manageable it, like size wise you, do, yeah. you, you can walk around and you don't actually need to have a lovely glorious country walk or arthur's seat you don't need to do that you can just walk around the streets and it's so beautiful and you, yeah, know, you, you can get around the place on foot so quickly so easily it's yeah. it's we're very you we are, we're very lucky in that way i know i know you are very lucky so enjoy that <laughs> go and have a walk up the royal mile for me and have a look down all those wee closes like like one i didn't discover till just a few years ago, was a devil's advocate close, you know, with the yeah. and that pub down there, that lovely bar. Yeah, it's a lovely little kit, lovely little secret that one, isn't it? It's beautiful. Really cool. I loved it. I did. I did a series on the channel oh, was a couple of years ago now, but it, it's one that I wish I could do again. Where I just started at the top of the Royal Mile and I went down every single close, oh. started at the top, and I do four or five on a video. And I just start the talk because obviously I don't know what some of them just lead to a dead end. Some of them won't go to houses. Some of them go all the way to the grass market. Some don't go anywhere. But just walking down every single one of them, and the, every single one of them, I discovered some little gem. Okay. Be it a beautiful building, be it the the, the Devil's Advocate pub, but it, every single one of them there was something to explore. It was so nice. Yeah. Oh, that part of town just blows me away every time, and and then even like. I think it was only the last few years as well. I went into Hollywood Palace and did the touristy thing, and and again, I, I love that. You know, that's the glorious thing about living in a city that's so historical. That even as someone that lives there the whole life or for a long time, you can still feel like a tourist and yeah. feel like learning um, and be surprised and enjoy a day out if you want to, or you can just feel like a local and go up Princess Street and moan about all the tourists, which I do as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do that as well. But I, I know what you mean, like, because I'm always researching the city for various history stories to share with people on the channel or anything like that. And guaranteed, I will always find something I didn't know. And I've been doing the channel for about three years full time now, and I still find stories every time I'm looking and I, that I didn't know, which is incredible. Yeah. No, it's cool. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start to round up because I'm sure you've got, you know, a life to get back when this dead and chatting to me. Um, so if anyone's gonna come over, what sort of top tips would you have when visiting Scotland in general? Oh, in general, well, give yourself as much time as you can. <laughs> That's for sure. When I, I actually last summer in the window of the lockdown did the North Coast 500. Um, have you done? Oh, I'd so like to do that. It was for my 40th birthday, my fiancé got us a wee trip in a motorhome and uh, we did it for 10 days. So I'd recommend, oh, yeah, you need more time. So I want you to go to the Friesen Gallery as well and go all the way down to the Mull of Galloway. Yeah. Go down there and like pop into Gatehouse, go and get some ice cream. 
like Kima Galloway. <laughs> <laughs> got to go to Edinburgh, got to go to Glasgow. Oh, goodness, it's hard, isn't it? Really it is hard. hard. But the North Coast 500, for me, really opened my eyes to, and to the, you know, you, when people sort of talk about how beautiful Scotland is, you're like, yeah, yeah, I know. And you're like, aye, but do you know? <laughs> and not to get in it. And because you've seen the photographs of the beautiful beaches, of the sea stacks, of the mountains, and you go, God, that is lovely. But there's nothing like actually living in it, camping yeah. in it, staying overnight. And and when we did it in the motorhome, we would find like random little places to stay overnight. What was the one? Latherin Wheel Harbour, Latherin Wheel sort of north of Dorna. Yeah. So we went up round that way in Inverness and then um, anti-clockwise round. And this little harbour we stayed in was just, there was no one else there. And it was, and it's something you just don't do. Like, or I certainly hadn't done before that. And that sort of like quiet and loveliness. And then I went up around the North Coast and then coming down the West Coast, just blow your mind stunning. Those yeah, it, re- it really is. There's something about it when you look, the, the few times, I've never done the North Coast 500, I would love to. Uh, but wh- sometimes when you look at it, and maybe this is a, a, an issue with the, the, the time we live in now, you kind of have to go, that looks fake because it is so beautiful. You know what I mean? Sometimes the colours and everything, you're just like, how can that not be CGI? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it does look like that. It, you know, it, it does look like a Harry Potter film or, or it, that, that's, that is that beautiful. Yeah. And we see so many, like, I don't know about you, but I love a good, like, David Attenborough type documentary or something oh, like that. Oh, yeah. And, and so you feel like you know them. You feel like, yeah, yeah, I've seen these beautiful landscapes. But to be there, and, and also, it's it just feels really good for a person. So anyone coming to Scotland, I'd really urge you to get, you know, go to the lovely cities and soak up some good history, but get yourself somewhere where there's in the middle of nowhere because there's no feeling like it. The big sky, we, we camped one night at the top of Loch Torridon and we're looking down in the loch and we, what, was the, what do you call it, the satellite, we could see the satellite going over. The International Space Station. You know, and just it and blew my mind just being in that atmosphere and like the weather was mixed, but that made it even more of an yeah. adventure. You know, it made it more real. So I'd highly recommend getting yourselves a way out into the sticks and you'd really sort of like and of course everyone's just lovely and you know We're very welcoming. We really are very welcoming. I so I would highly recommend all that. Go anywhere. Go anywhere in Scotland, but do spend time. Give yourself as much time because we did it. We did the North Coast in ten days, and we added a few days to come down Loch Lomond and then finish in Gatehouse. <laughs> that's a, that's a random place to finish. That's funny how you chose I, there. I, it was an unusual itinerary, but it was Gatehouse. <laughs> I had to somehow be there. <laughs> um, but yeah, spend some time. Give yourself as much time as possible because it's the best place in the world. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I'm going to finish with what I like to call difficult questions for us Scots. Oh. And you kind of started to touch on this. So, shortbread or tablet? <gasps> Do you make me choose? Tablet. <laughs> oh, see, I thought you were going to. Bar- I thought you were going to barter a little bit there, but no, you went straight in with the tablet. Yeah, no, sugar fiend can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever tried to make it? Uh, what a combination of shortbread and tablet. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's a really good idea, actually. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I think I made tablet years ago with my mum. and it's really difficult. Yeah, I don't have the patience for that. And also, it's like a lot of the best baking things in the world. I can't be making them because I just eat them all immediately. Yeah. And then you're a bit like, oh, I don't feel very good now. Yeah. Self-control when it comes to the good stuff. <laughs> I've only just managed to master making pancakes. <laughs> that's, it's pancake day today, yes. It is pancake day today, but yeah, I've only just I made us some for lunch, and you know how many years it took me to get my pancakes right. Could not do it. Could no. not do it. But now, but but again, and that's an easy recipe. Tablet, <laughs> not a chance. Yeah, no, I know, tricky, but nearly worth persevering with, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Iron brew or whiskey? Iron brew. Oh, again, straight for the sugar. Yeah, and uh, I've tried with whiskey. I've really tried. I've been on like some lovely um, 
distillery tours and really find it interesting. And at the end, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm like, uh, uh, no, <laughs> can't do it. I think it, it, you'd be surprised. It's, a, it's been a 50-50 mix of some people that that enjoy whiskey and some people that just like like you just can't. And I think it is a... It is, you, it, it, I don't think there's a better description of an acquired taste. I think you really need to learn how to appreciate it. You know yeah. what I mean? I remember weaning myself onto red wine. You know what I mean? <laughs> Years ago. And that's something that you have to eventually. Okay. Yeah. But again, whiskey is fine too too hard to drink yeah i mean i was to say when i when i when i remember when i was younger of course once i hit 18 and had my first alcoholic drink um having to learn how to drink lager i remember not liking that at first and then eventually you know i acquired that taste <laughs> forcing it down come on you're yeah. it. just one more pint come on <laughs> um would again you touched on this one square sausage or black pudding Yeah, it's got to be square sausage. Mm. I'm liking the decisiveness. Some people really take a while. I'm liking the straight in there. Well, do you know what it is? Because of all our chat about food, I'm now a little bit hungry. So I think <laughs> if I answer quickly, you might give me some. <laughs> <laughs> Haggis, neeps and tatties or mince and tatties? Oh, no! <laughs> that is hard because my mother's mince and tatties is off the charts. Really? Oh, Oh, see now, as after you've seen, I've been decisive. I don't know if I can decide. Um, well, These, this, this is where the interview really gets serious. This is, you know, this is the the all everything before. That's just banter. This is the serious <laughs> question. Take it all that out. Yeah, <laughs> it's got to have to be. It's going to have to be mince and tatties because of the association with home as well. <gasps> yeah, a big glass of milk. Thanks, mom. Or any more? Yeah, that that really I think missing tat is, is a definite and I've said this many times on many interviews, it's a mum thing, isn't it? And and everyone's mum makes it different. <laughs> yeah. And I keep whenever I try to make it, I'm, I always have to phone her and go, What is it you do? And she's like, literally nothing. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, I don't know why you find it so hard. I'm like, Does it doesn't taste like yours? <laughs> she's like, There's really not a lot going on there. You're right. When you were growing up, if you went to your pal's house and your mo- their mum had made mince and tatties, it was never the same. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was never... It, it, everyone's mum makes it differently. I had... Um, again, I've mentioned this before at some point. There's the, the One of the supporters of the channel was on the American version of Bakehouse. Uh, um, Bake Off. Oh, I. And she reached out to me because she was looking for Scottish recipes. So I said mince and tatties. I goes, but you'll never find a definitive recipe for it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. I wonder if there is somewhere. I once bought the Bruins cookbook. It's probably something in there. And that's oh, not far off the <laughs> definitive version. Well, no, you can't go wrong with the Bruins. You really can't. You really can't. <laughs> uh, last, but by no means least, Tunnock's tea cakes or caramel wafers? Going after the tea cake, isn't it? It's just uh, the, 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 I think the caramel wafer is a biscuit you can have at any time. Uh-huh. Tea cake feels like something special, doesn't it? Yeah, you're like, oh, I've treated myself. And also, in the last care package I got, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, bag of some, chocolate. <laughs> there was obviously just lots of like loveliness that's all disappeared now. But there was also like a, a supermarket's own brand of caramel wafers. So and so they could and they were actually were quite nice. Oh. So I'm like, ah, they can be copied, but you cannot copy a tea cake. No, I don't. I, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. You can get off-brand car- caramel wafers or even off-brand caramel logs. Oh, I do like a caramel. Log. See, you're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> a lunch. <laughs> you know, that, that's a proper treat. That's got to be like just sugary, calorific nonsense. That is. <laughs> Just on that on an extra side question, what do you do with the wrapper then afterwards of the the tea cake? Oh, um, I'm 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 quite sort of like I am quite fiddly with wrappers. Like a crisp packet, I will always fold into a triangle. So um, I don't think I've got a set thing with a Tunnock's tea cake wrapper, but it'll definitely get some sort of folded, probably into a long strip 
and then tied into a knot. All right, I've done I've done that for, for the most time. That could say everyone's got a thing. Some people like to roll it in a ball. Alan Shearer was very much I like to roll it into a ball and <laughs> had piles of them in his pockets in his dressing gown at the end of a panto run apparently. <laughs> um, uh, but I like to I, I've got to flatten them out. You know, get it into that perfect square and and try to get all the creases out of it as much as possible. Yeah, I think I would probably do something like that, but then fold it up and it's got to be equal. It's like even talking about it's still giving me that satisfying feeling of doing that really nice yeah. fold. <laughs> and it's just a bit of tin foil. <laughs> I know. Bless. Just cut out you, since, since you've not got tea cakes in it, you just cut out a bit tin foil in a square and then you you'll be fine. Get a red marker. <laughs> I'm going to find me rocking in a corner somewhere wishing to <laughs> Your partner's going to be like, how was the interview? You're going to be like, oh, you yeah. broke me. Where's the chocolatey things? Where's the <laughs> <dumb>? <laughs> Katrina, this has been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing the time and coming on and chatting. I've, I've loved every second of it. Oh, it's been lovely to talk to you, Tony. Thanks. That was lovely. That was, that was so nice to get the chat to Katrina. Katrina, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your time and having a chat. It was, it was really lovely to chat to her. If you enjoyed that, guys, as always, please remember, leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe on both YouTube and podcast as well. But wherever you are, look after yourself. Till next time. Bye, humans.